All right, well, hi, everybody. I am super excited to be with you all tonight because um, tonight I get to talk to you all about the founding of the modern state of Israel in historical context, which is so, so important to understand when you're out there advocating on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, my name is Josh Ahrens, and I've been so honored to work for Kufi for the last five and a half years. Um, I originally found Kufi when I was a student on a college campus. Uh, a little over five years ago, and when I was a student, I was just actually shocked at, at some of the, the behaviors that I saw on campus when it came to talking about Israel, when it came to how the Jewish students were treated. I went into campus as a Christian, and I had no idea that there was a problem with anti-Semitism on our college campuses. And so when I saw this firsthand, I was so shocked and angered and said, you know, as a Christian, I can't just stand by and let my fellow students be bullied and dehumanized. I can't let a particular people group be dehumanized and delegitimized. And so what I'm going to do is everything in my power I can to educate myself and stand up on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people. I didn't know about Kufi at the time, so uh, you can imagine I was very excited to find out about Kufi and the amazing, amazing work they were doing I signed up for their scholarship to D.C. for college students. Every July, Christians United for Israel has their D.C. Summit. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have gone to the D.C. Summit, or if you haven't, you definitely should. Let us know in the comments if you've gone before, what it was like, what you thought of it. Let us know if you're planning on going. Um, let us know where you're watching from tonight. It's really, really awesome to have you guys here and to be able to talk with you guys about things that are so important and so exciting that are happening in the pro-Israel world. So when it comes to the history of the nation of Israel, of course we can go back thousands and thousands of years, right? The history of, of Israel and of the Jewish people is a very rich and deep and varied history. Um, for our purposes, we don't need to go back that far. All we need to do is go back to the early 20th century uh, before World War I. If you look at a map of Europe in the Middle East before World War I. It looked very different than it looks today. You will notice that there are a lot of countries on our map today that were not there uh, before World War I. So for instance, most of the countries along this line did not exist, in fact, before World War I. So we have Finland, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and so on. Um, too many to name in one video, that didn't exist before World War I. They, of course, existed. In fact, there was always a Finnish people. There was always a distinct ethnic group who had Finnish culture, spoke the Finnish language, and so on. Same with the Polish people. Same with so many others. Um, they existed as a nation. They existed, in fact, they had an identity, and yet they did not have a country on the map because it was just considered part of some empire that had taken over their country and just called it part of that empire. Nonetheless, this, these people still existed there. The same thing is true in the Middle East. The Middle East was mostly dominated by the Ottoman Empire, which controlled this, this area here, um, which now includes um, the countries that were created after World War I and after World War II, which are Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Israel, Jordan, and more. And so what we have going on in the Middle East at that time is the same thing that was going on in Europe at the time. These empires were, were fighting one another for supremacy over the region, and the Ottoman Empire was one of those. The Ottoman Empire joined on the side of Germany and, and those aligned with them. And as, as we know, they lost. So the, after World War I, the Ottoman Empire ceases to be. It crumbles. And so what you have is this huge power vacuum in the Middle East that the victorious powers, mainly uh, Britain and France, are saying, okay, wh what are we going to do with this? Because there are a lot of powers who want to dominate and control the Middle East. And what we need to do is try to find a way to create some kind of stability there and some kind of peace there. We don't want, the whole idea was that they didn't want these empires to come back up and begin fighting each other again, both in Europe and in the Middle East. 
So what they did was this this idea of the nation state becomes integral to the plan for how to redivide Europe and the Middle East into these political entities that will be, in theory, more stable than th these competing empires. So the nation state idea really takes hold and what the victorious powers are trying to do is is say we can see that there are certain groups of people with a distinct national identity whether they're polish whether they're finnish um, whatever their national identity is we're going to do our best to create a democracy with its identity based on that so this is this is what you have this is why we have a poland and a finland today and um, many other countries, including countries in the Middle East. So the same idea was applied there. And the basic idea was similar. We have different people groups. What we're going to do is separate them into distinct democracies with a distinct ethnic identity and hopefully create some stability and some security there. And no matter how you draw the lines, you're going to have a majority of a certain group and then a minority of the other groups. And so they knew that going in and realizing that you can't just draw one line here, one line here, one line here, um, and have these different groups fit neatly into those lines because all the ethnicities and identities of the Middle East were very much intertwined. So that's what they did. So similar to what they did in Europe, they created new countries based on historic ethnic identities in that region. So they created Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Iraq, Turkey, um, and more. And by doing this, they hope to create democracies that would exist side by side in peace there. And there were certain expectations that went along with that as well. So for example, each it was understood had a majority population of so Lebanon had a majority Christian population, for example. Syria had a majority Muslim population, for example. So did Jordan, so did Iraq. Um, Israel had a majority Jewish population. And each of these had minorities of, of those same groups in their country. And it was always stressed and always expected that these countries would protect and preserve their minority populations and that these populations would have the same rights, the same protections as everyone else. Unfortunately, most of the, these countries didn't live up to that. Um, and we can see the, the results of that today. The, the Christian communities in Lebanon and Syria have been absolutely devastated. Many of them have fled. Those that still live there are living in unimaginably bad conditions. The one exception to that is the state of Israel. That means Israel has done its very best to protect its minority populations, to give them equal rights, to give them equal protections, to bring them into the national community. And for example, the Christian community in Israel um, is not only the, the safest in the Middle East, but it's also the most successful. The Christians of Israel are the most successful demographic in Israel when you look at their education and when you look at their income. Israel is the only country in the region where their Christian population is growing. Christians in Israel hold public office. They're judges, they're police officers, they're anything, anything any Jewish citizen of Israel can be, a Christian Israeli can be, an Arab Muslim Israeli can be. In other words, in this region of where we see so much extreme fighting and um, violence and intolerance and so on, within the borders of Israel, you see the majority and the minorities living together side by side in a way that is so remarkably different than any of the other neighboring countries. And so when you have people who are trying to suggest that there's something illegitimate about Israel, something that makes Israel less deserving than any other people group, you can really look to the facts to see that that is just not true. If anything, Israel is the exact opposite of what they are suggesting. Israel is an example of the very best of 
what you can have in the Middle East, and it's an example of what the rest of the Middle East could look like. Another thing to remember that Israel's detractors are sort of hoping we forget is that when Israel declared their statehood, they said in their founding documents, we extend a hand of peace to all of our neighbors. And that's a hand that is still extended today. It's something that you hear Israeli leaders reiterating over and over again, saying we continue to extend a hand of peace to our neighbors. We want to live in peace and harmony with our neighbors. Um, it's something that is part of Israel's identity. It's part of who they are. Israel's detractors are hoping that we don't notice that, and they're also hoping that we don't notice that Israel's neighbors, let's say Hamas in Gaza, for example, their founding documents continue to start with lines like, Israel will exist until we obliterate it. Not very peaceful, right? So why are people creating this sort of cloud of suspicion around Israel? They're hoping that we don't notice who, what's really going on and who really is responsible for the continued violence in the Middle East. It's not Israel. If anything, Israel is trying every single day to maintain stability and to help their neighbors and to maintain peace. Israel's bringing in refugees and wounded people from Syria because of the battles going on in Syria, and they're helping them in Israeli hospitals. What could legitimize a, a nation more than that, more than reaching out to your neighbors, even when they're your sworn enemies, and saying, because of who we are, because of our values, we're going to help you no matter what, and we hope someday you understand that we're your friends and not your enemies. And so to those who continue to suggest that Israel is somehow lesser than, somehow undeserving of the same rights and protections and securities that we have all agreed for a long time that nations are entitled to, um, I would suggest that there's nothing wrong with Israel. There's something wrong in the worldview of somebody who cannot simply recognize that Israel and the Jewish people have a right to live in their own land and peace and security. There's something wrong with a worldview that doesn't want to acknowledge that the minorities of Israel are very well off and that the minorities in the neighboring countries are those who are really being persecuted. If someone really cares about human rights and really cares about truth, he or she will see Israel as an example of so much that is right and so much that can be done right and so much that we all can learn about how better to, to govern our affairs and to welcome disenfranchised community. So to those who are constantly trying to find a way to call Israel's existence into question, I would ask them, are you going to call Finland's existence into question? Are you going to say Polish people don't have a right to a homeland and a national identity and to security? If there was a wave of, of terror attacks in another country, would you ever find any reason to possibly justify that. And another thing that Israel's detractors are hoping we forget is that there has always been a Jewish presence in the land of Israel. It's not something new. It's something, Jews have lived in this land continuously for thousands of years. And something that is often forgotten or overlooked is that Israel's capital, Jerusalem, was a Jewish majority city for a hundred years before the establishment of the state of Israel. So in the middle of the 1800s, Jerusalem was already a, a majority Jewish city and there were Jewish communities all over the land of Israel. So to say that Israel somehow doesn't have a place in the Middle East is just absolutely absurd. The Jewish people are an indigenous population with a distinct national identity, a distinct ethnicity, um, a distinct language, distinct customs, of course they have a right to have their own state in the Middle East among the other nations that live in the Middle East. And it doesn't mean that anybody else loses just because the Jewish people have their own state. If anything, as I've mentioned, the minorities of Israel, the non-Jewish citizens of Israel, are living in the most freedom and the most prosperity of anywhere in the region. So with all of that being said, knowing that so many countries were founded with the same idea, the same rationale as Israel was, um, knowing that Israel takes care of its minorities, 
knowing that Israel continues to be a contributor to the world in technology, in disaster aid, um, in friendship to the United States and to the Western world, knowing all of that, not only is Israel legitimate, Israel has more than enough to stand on when it comes to taking its place among the nations and really being a light unto the nations. And um, as a Christian, I am very, very proud to say that I love Israel and I support the people of Israel because I believe they have the very same rights and the very same value that anybody else does in any other country. And whenever I see them maligned or unfairly attacked or criticized or what have you, I'm so, so glad that Christians United for Israel exists. And I'm so glad that we have over 4 million members and that each and every one of you are out there standing up, educating yourselves, taking courage and telling the truth about this wonderful place and this wonderful people. So thank you very much. God bless you all. And I will see you soon.